Thanks. I'd like to start this morning, well, thanks for turning up so early on a Sunday morning. But I'd like to start, first of all, to tell you two stories about, uh, or rather a story about two patients I recently saw in Heart Valve Clinic. Uh, first was a 58-year-old man who eight years ago had an AVR uh, with a 25 millimeter tissue prosthesis. And he was advised to have a tissue prosthesis by his surgeon because of his job, because he worked in a factory. But when you actually um, quizzed him about this, he actually worked in an office in a factory. He was a manager of a factory. And I saw him in the clinic. His last echo showed he had a, a gradient of 92 millimeters mercury across the prosthesis, and he had class 3 angina. Okay, so that's the first patient. Another patient I saw in Valve Clinic um, was a similar aged lady at an AVR with a mechanical prosthesis. Uh, three weeks after she went home, she slipped on some ice, hit her head. She got an extradural hematoma, uh, needed neurosurgical evacuation. Physically, she recovered, but mentally, psychologically, it absolutely destroyed her. And it transpired that she had gone to the anticoagulation clinic appointment the day after she was discharged, as we tend to do, and then she was given a three-week appointment. So her INR, when she had her injury, was nine. Now, the reason I, I, I you know, bring your attention to these two stories is that, number one, we are here talking about uh, prosthetic valve choice in the younger patient. Uh, and number two, because there are risks, and as, as my slide says, there are you know, evils associated with either types of prosthesis. And then the two cases that I mentioned, they're both completely preventable if these patients had been given uh, correct advice. So my name is Norm Briff. I'm a cardiac surgeon. Sheffield, as I've mentioned, I, I run the heart valve surveillance postoperative clinic. Um, I'm president of the British Heart Valve Society as well, and the society I lead receives grants from these companies, but I don't have any personal conflicts to declare. So in answer to the question, I have absolutely no idea what the answer to the question, are we implanting too few mechanical valves? I know, as illustrated by these two stories, that keeping the patient at the absolute center of the decision-making process is key. And as I said, when it comes to the evidence, I'm going to concentrate on that group, the 50 to 70 age group. <clears throat> but what I hope by covering these topics today, I should provide some food for thought for you to help you help the patient uh, make a, a correct decision. So a good place is to start is actually to find out what's happening in current practice. And is there a pointer? No, okay. Um, as you can see, this is practice in the United States. So if you look at the 55 to 64 uh, graph, in 13 years it's gone from 10% to 50% use of tissue prosthesis. In the United Kingdom it's even starker. So the, the absolute height of mechanical valve, prosthetic valve use in the under 70s was in 1995. Since 1995, the percentage of prosthetic valves has been increasing. And this is very recent data that I collected myself over the, the past few weeks, knowing that I was going to give this talk. So this is from cardiac registries of six fairly large units in the United Kingdom. And in, what, 12, 13 years, we've gone from just over 30% to over 60%. Of, and these are patients having isolated AVR aged between 50 and 69. So good places to start is the guidelines, you know, it is, is this change in practice backed by the evidence? And a good place to look at for the evidence is um, the guidelines. Sorry about this. Um, so US the US and, and, and European guidelines are a bit different. Uh, the, the US guidelines are pretty generic. Uh, European guidelines are a bit more granular. So if we look at the age range where the guidelines suggest there is uncertainty, the U.S. guidelines are pretty broad. So it goes between 50 and 70. So they say it's under 50, it's okay to put in a mechanical valve. Above 70, it's okay to put in a tissue valve. So there's a huge range. That, that's the U.S. guidelines. And the U.S. guidelines lump mechanical and tissue together and lump MVRs and AVRs together. The European guidelines are a bit more specific. Their age range is much smaller. It's just five years, between 60 and 65. So they say below 60, it's okay to put in a mechanical valve for an AVR. Above 65, it's okay to put in a, a tissue valve. 
Apologies to all my friends and colleagues around. Oh, thank you. Uh, apologies to my friends and colleagues around the, uh, around the world to sit on committee guidelines, but I think it's important to look at the, to try and look at the evidence behind the headlines. So let, let's look at the primary evidence. We have the two key randomized controlled trials. We keep going back to these because number one, they were big trials. Number two, they'll never be repeated. And number three. In essence, nothing really has changed since the findings of those trials. So these trials, the data was generated, the, the trials were started in the late 80s, the trials were published in the noughties. So the first, this is the, uh, the VA trial, 15-year outcomes from, th 11, from 13 VA centers. 80% of the patients were between 51 and 70, so it covers the, 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 the patients we're talking about today. Sorry. And essentially, the outcome from the American trial, the, 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 the recommendation was that if you're under 65 and having an AVR, you should have a mechanical valve. If you're over 65, you should have a tissue valve. Then there was the UK trial, or, or more specifically, the Scottish trial. Very similar. Uh, randomized controlled trial between a Hancock, um, I think Hancock and Carpentier Edwards, and a Bjorkshire Lee single tilt. And the, the main recommendation of this, the Scottish trial was that for AVR patients, if you have uh, a life expectancy of 10 years or more, then you should have a mechanical valve. And the age range was about, about just over half of the patients were in the age range we're talking about for this trial. After the randomized tr trials came the simulation papers. And essentially, these were modeling papers to try and establish from the data out there what is the, the ideal age to change over from a mechanical to a tissue prosthesis? And first was the, uh, a UK paper, Sarban Storica, some guys from Papert and Prakash Punjabi from, from the uh, Hammersmith. And they used data from, re from a registry. They used data from Ken Taylor's audit, which he ran over 20 years. So, so they had huge amounts of patients to look at, over 5,000. And essentially, what they discovered using this registry data was the age when the post-operative event-free survival was better with a biological prosthesis, okay? And events meant you die, you bleed, or you need a reoperation, okay? So the, 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 the age at which it became better was uh, 67 for males and 68 for females. The Dutch under uh, Ahana Tuckenberg did a similar study. They didn't use registry data. They looked at published papers. And what they found is, the, the, again, when uh, the age at which event-free life expectancy became better with tissue prosthesis was between 60 and 63. So over the, over the past 15 years, there have been dozens and dozens of papers looking at this looking at which is better, tissue mechanical, in this age group, between 50 and 70. And that's it, dozens. These are just some of them. Um, and a student of mine, Charlotte Holmes, who's presenting this data on Tuesday, did a meta-analysis of these papers. Now, this is not a proper meta-analysis, because the vast majority, just bar one, were not randomized control trials. These were retrospective series of patients. And what she found, she did a meta-analysis. So three of these papers, of these dozens of papers, showed superior survival with mechanical prosthesis. Uh, one paper showed superior survival with tissue prosthesis. But if you, if you took the whole lot, they actually found no difference between the two. This is pure survival. And then if you looked at uh, risks, so bleeds obviously favored tissue prosthesis, reoperate, structural valve deterioration favored, um, favored mechanical prosthesis. So we just go back to this. Um, there is no clear, robust evidence to favor one or the other in this age group. Okay, maybe slightly in favor of mechanical. So it comes back to the class one recommendation of both the US and European guidelines, which is this has to be a patient-specific decision. And yet, you, you, you know, you, you, you see what the patient's preference is, but you, you, you see all, all sorts of things. Which of the lesser of two evils will suit the, that particular patient in front of you when you come to discuss it? There are a couple of fundamental differences between these two evils. So bleeds on the one hand 
structural valve deterioration among the other. Number one, bleeds are a problem with the treatment. Structural valve deterioration is a problem with the prosthesis. And even more important is the time frame. So bleeds occur within six to 12 months. Structural valve deterioration takes 10 years. And, you know, in the West, we all have a fairly short time frame of the way we perceive our lives. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, structural valve deterioration is just too far in the future to think about. But the converse is also true, because if you come up with a solution that's going to cure bleeds, then you can see a difference within 6 to 12 months. If you come up with a spanking new tissue valve that's not going to degenerate, you're not going to see any difference for 10 years. So that's quite, quite an important point to make. So let's look at the hemorrhage. So the first paper that studied hemorrhage, or optimal anticoagulation in mechanical patients, was this one from the New England Journal of Medicine. And they're the first to come up with the, these kind of uh, graphs. So, you know, lower INRs, you've got more ischemic strokes. Higher INRs, you had more hemorrhagic strokes. They combined the two to, 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 prevent, to, to present this event curve with 95% confidence intervals. And they came up with a safe range from 2.5 to 4.9. And then a whole bunch of papers started coming out. A Riva paper from France and the Gilia study from Germany. And that showed, in actual fact, it was safe to drop your INR down to 2.5. And by dropping your INR slowly, you had fewer bleeds without incurring the cost of greater ischemic strokes. Uh, and then there was an um, uh, Italian study, uh, St. Jude by leaflet valve, again, they dropped the INR down to 1.5. Again, fewer bleeds without any increase in ischemic strokes. And obviously the PROAC trial with the Onyx valve, which did something similar. The other thing we found out from Eric Butchart's work in Cardiff was the, the absolute crucial importance of INR stability. So patients whose INRs are all over the place, they don't, they, their survival is terrible. Whereas if you had ni nice steady INRs, your survival was similar to the UK population. And one way of ensuring, and a couple of very good papers, again, from France and Germany, one way of ensuring stable INR is home monitoring and point-of-care testing. The other thing, there are a couple of recent developments in anticoagulation. One is tocalferin. So tocalferin is very similar to warfarin. It's a vitamin K antagonist. The difference from warfarin is it's not subject to cytochrome P450 um, uh, degradation. So... It, it's not subject to this genotypic uh, variance you get, so it's not, uh, um, it, it's, it doesn't interact as much as warfarin with other drugs and with things in the diet. The other problem with warfarin is the INR itself. The INR test is, is pretty, it's got a wide range of wide confidence intervals. And there's a new test called the fixed prothrombin test. It's a bit very far more accurate than the INR, and that in AF patients being shown to to be associated with better outcomes. And obviously, atrial fibrillation. You can have a tissue valve, but as soon as you hit 65, your chances of being anticoagulated start to go up quite a lot because of atrial fibrillation. There have been lots of studies about attitudes to uh, anticoagulants, so mainly in AF patients. And there's no doubt that, that the benefits of anticoagulation okay, are invisible okay, and tend to be downplayed. The risks of anticoagulation are very visible and tend to be exaggerated. And I suspect the same is, is, the same is in a population of patients who, who are undergoing heart valve surgery. So let's look at the other evils, structural valve deterioration. <coughs> yeah, number one, um, life expectancy is going up very rapidly. So patients, if you put in a valve in, at the age of 60, that valve has to last for 25 years. We know a lot about anticalcification treatments. This is the latest attempt. It looks fantastic new valve. The, the in vivo data with animals looks fantastic, but obviously we're not going to know for many, many years. Uh, and then there's valve and valve. Contrary to popular opinion, I don't think this is going to be a huge game changer, uh, especially if we're talking about the very young patients, because various reasons, leaflet thrombosis and limited durability. The other important thing to mention, I'll, I'll quickly finish this, is... Patients are being echoed now. Now we've got hard valve clinics. So valve prostheses are under the microscope like they've never been before. And, you know, the standard uh, definition of structural valve deterioration. If you actually go looking for deterioration, you can find it fairly, fairly early. Is this opening Pandora's box or does it matter or does it not matter? So, I'll, and then there's the healthcare economics. So I'll... I'll, I'll I'll, I'll skip that. So, in the future, there's no doubt there's going to be safe anticoagulation care. 
I think there's going to be improved surveillance with PROMS wearable devices. I think patients are going to be followed up, but probably remotely. I think there will be improved tissue prosthesis, better EOA, maybe rapid deployment devices. I'm sure Michael will tell us more about that. Personalized choice. How many in this room know that diabetics do worse with tissue valves? You know, a couple of big studies have shown that now. So maybe we need to identify the patients who will do well with a mechanical hood, who will do well with a tissue valve. Uh, nice guidelines coming out in 2021. So in conclusion, in answer to the question, I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, patient preference should be the first and last of your considerations. Think of the lesser of two evils that suits that particular patient. Maintain a laser focus on the evidence. Advise on evidence and not prejudice. Okay, and finally, times they are changing because we live in a bit of a golden age in heart valve disease at the moment. Thank you. I'd like to thank these guys for giving me the data that I published earlier and British Heart Valve Society, 7, 8 of November. Put that in your diary. Thank you. Thank you.